History was made today as it is every year at the Masters Water Ski Tournament at Callaway Gardens. Competing in the Masters is the ultimate goal for water skiers worldwide. Correct Craft Boats have pulled this tournament for many years, taking part in the realization of dreams. Correct Craft is a history maker. But just what is the history behind Correct Craft? To understand the company, one must first understand the family responsible for its birth, the Maloons. The name Maloon can be traced to the Maloons of the 17th century in Portsmouth, England. In that time period, Portsmouth, as it is today, was a gateway to the ocean-going world of trade. Boating and manufacturing of boats were an integral part of the commoner's life. In the era of the first pilgrims to the New World, an exodus of Puritans from England led the way to America. The Maloons sailed to New England and settled in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, so named for their homeland. Being a Puritan people, the Maloons held to the doctrine of hard work and the fear of God. Centuries later, this creed continues to guide the hands of the Maloons as they craft their boats. One century after the Maloons' immigration to America, the United States was formed out of a hard-fought war. General George Washington called on a man by the name of Hopley Yeaton, whose mother was a Maloon, to organize the first United States Coast Guard. That same organization guards our waters today. The Roaring Twenties a golden age, the era of the flapper, abolition, silent movies, a rich time in America. The entrepreneurial spirit soared with the stock market. New business ventures were popping up in all corners of the country, pioneering the way for future generations. The year is 1924. In the small New England town of Ossipee, New Hampshire, Walter C. Maloon decides to close down his garage business and move to Central Florida. Walter C. arrived in Florida with his wife Marion and their three children, Walter O., Ralph, and Harold. W.C., like other new arrivals, had hopes of becoming a big landowner, making his fortune in the real estate market. However, when the wealthy investors from Chicago withdrew their money and went elsewhere, most of the other small investors, including W.C., lost their shirts in the business. Disillusioned and broke, W.C. knew he had to find another way to support his family, and soon. He knew how to build a boat, so that's what he decided to do. Thus, in 1925, he opened his very own boat-building business in Pine Castle, Florida. During this time, the market for boats was primarily limited to the upper class. The majority of boats built were large, far out of the reach of the common man's income. W.C. planned to build boats that everybody could afford. W.C. had only one jig, so he could build just one size of boat. He used the lap strake design, which essentially was overlapping planks in the manner of shingles. This technique enabled W.C. to construct a smaller, lighter boat, a new variety. So he called his new business the Florida Variety Boat Company. During the 20s, W.C. gained recognition for boating in the area by organizing promotions such as towing gliders behind boats, using aquaplanes, water skis, and freeboards. W.C. built speedboats and raced them on Lake Ivanhoe, usually winning. Rides were offered in the water toboggan, powered by a large outboard motor. These good times provided comic relief for harsher periods in the life of the company. W.C. had two partners in the early years. His first partner lasted a year and the second for five years. Both partners saw no future in the business and sold out. The situation looked grim for the struggling business. Then the Great Depression hit. And uh, I can remember that uh, my dad, uh, going upstairs where we lived on the second floor, and asking my mother how much money she had. And uh, 
I can remember one time she said, well, I have $11. And he said, well, let me have it. And he went downstairs and split that up among the people that were working for him then and, and sent them home with it. That's all they had for that week. All of the banks closed up and uh, there was no uh, way of drawing money or uh, cashing checks or getting by. So we had to figure out a way to get a little bit of cash and that's one of the reasons why Dad uh, put us out on the road traveling and we traveled all over the southeastern part of the United States uh, uh, taking uh, passengers on the boat and charging 25 cents for adults and 10 cents for children and this is the way we were able to feed the boat company and keep going. Occasionally we could find someone with some money and we'd sell a boat, but that was very difficult. Uh, but Dad was very good at taking care of emergencies. Uh, sometimes uh, he would go out on a, a Friday and sell a boat in order to come back and make the payroll on Saturday night. Now all payrolls are meant on, on uh, Friday night, but in those days it was always on Saturday night. So Dad would go out and sell a boat for less than what uh, he's supposed to sell it for. In fact, he took a loss on it sometimes in order to be able to make the payroll and uh, keep the boat factory going. In 1930, the Florida Variety Boat Company became known as the Pine Castle Boat and Construction Company. Eight years later, W.C. happened to overhear a radio commercial explaining the benefits of the correct heel for your shoe. He later thought to himself, why not the correct craft for you? Thus, the name Correct Craft came into being and is still today the official title of the company. Correct Craft was incorporated in 1947. Correct Craft played an important role in history toward the end of the Second World War. In early 1945, General Dwight D. Eisenhower of the United States Army pushed his troops through France, heading to Berlin for the planned attack. The march was going almost too well. The troops would reach the Rhine River far in advance of the estimated crossing date. They had an advantage over the enemy, but time could turn into an enemy as well unless boats and ammunition arrived soon. The crossing of the Rhine had to be on March 10th. Eisenhower rushed an SOS cable to Washington, calling for the delivery of 569 storm boats by March 5th. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers listed all the boat companies suitable for the job. Several were contacted for participation in the project, including Correct Craft. After hearing the request, WC called an emergency family prayer meeting. The Army wanted Correct Craft to build 300 storm boats by February 28th, with a AAA preference rating. The date was now February 9th. Friends told WC that the construction of the 300 boats would be impossible, considering that the company's normal production for February was only 48 boats. However, the Maloons committed themselves to the request from the Army. The family knew it would take a miracle from God to complete the task, and they were willing to trust him. Obviously, it was a very difficult assignment, so we decided that if, if it's going to have to be uh, a miracle, that we better consult the one that was a miracle maker. And God's the only miracle maker that Dad knew, and the only miracle maker that Correct Craft knew. So we all got together and we prayed about it and came back and committed Correct Craft to build the 300 boats after asking the Lord how we could do it. On Saturday, February 10th, crews labored until midnight, gearing up for the increased production. Extra jigs had to be built and extra hands hired. That day, the Correct Craft workforce was increased from 60 to 320 employees. In the beginning, production was extremely slow. At the end of the day, on Monday, February 12th, only one boat had been built. Three boats were built on Tuesday, seven on Wednesday. With only 12 days left, just 11 out of the 300 boats were completed. Production had to be increased. That night, the Maloons held a prayer meeting asking God for help in the completion of the project. The next day, in answer to prayer, an idea was conceived to accelerate production, a new machine and a jig change. 
The jig was altered to accommodate the present production, and a man was contracted to build the new machine. The boat building continued. On Thursday, February 15th, the plant produced 13 boats. On Friday, 17. On Saturday, 21. In all, 62 of the 300 boats had been built, with only six days left to reach their goal. The troops in Europe desperately needed these boats, and the balloons were determined to provide them. We worked the people 16 to 18 hours every day except Sunday. And they were so anxious to work that it, it was women and, and uh, girls and old men is all we had for people in the plant uh, to, to, to work with. But uh, they were so anxious because they all had relatives over there that they wanted to have come back after the war. And they thought they were part of the war. After Sunday's day of rest, work picked up again on Monday, February 19th. The new machine was now in operation, and progress increased significantly. By now, boats were stacked up throughout the plant and down Orange Avenue, blocking street traffic. Correct Craft had permission to take over the streets thanks to village, county, and state approval. At this point, the workers were building up to 42 boats a day. With God's help, Correct Craft and the Maloons fulfilled their end of the bargain with the Army ahead of schedule. The truck hauled off the 306th boat on Saturday, February 24th, with four days to spare. The Maloons were also thankful that the Lord did not let it rain during the entire month of February, which is usually one of the wettest months of the year. We were the only company and three companies that were building these boats that met the schedule of the 300 boats, and we met it something like three or four days early. And the government uh, asked if they flew us material for another hundred boats, would we build another hundred boats for them by the end of the, the month? Which we did, not 300, but 400. And uh, I said, well, are these people uh, working on Sunday? And they said, yeah, they're all working on Sunday. We were the only ones that didn't work on Sunday. Astonishingly enough, correct craft boats were the only ones built to the proper specifications and consequently were the only ones used. As a result of the early crossing of the Rhine by the Allies, the Nazis failed to blow up a strategic railroad bridge at Remagen in time to stop the Allies from advancing. Two days later, Hitler executed three of his men whom he held responsible for what may have been the greatest blunder of the war. The boats only made one trip across the Rhine. That was the extent of their lives. However, military experts quoted in National Geographic magazine estimated that at least 15,000 American lives were saved by the miracle of Remagen. For its contribution to the victory of the Allies, Correct Craft was awarded the Army and Navy E Award by the United States government in a special ceremony at the plant on May 23, 1945. The account of the miracle production is preserved for posterity in the National Archives, Washington, D.C. The U.S. economy following the Second World War experienced an intense period of growth and expansion. America led the world in industry and technology, People were living better than their parents and expected to provide an even better way of life for their children. Most folks had plenty of money saved up due to cashing in their war bonds. Everyone was caught up in the nationwide spending frenzy. Correct Craft began manufacturing bigger boats after World War II, up to 50 footers, selling for as much as $86,000. Correct Craft, as well as all other boat companies, built boats as quickly as their production facilities could handle. It seemed every time a load of boats was delivered, people would see the delivery truck go by and call the company, wanting to either buy the boats for personal use or set up their own Correct Craft dealership. The U.S. government offered Correct Craft a number of contracts to build a total of 400 boats. However, the company needed to increase its net worth in order to receive a bond issue to cover the contracts. 
Correctcraft quickly decided that another plant must be built in order to increase net worth and handle the excess demand. They chose the small coastal town of Titusville, Florida as the new plant site, little more than 50 miles away from the main plant in Orlando. The Titusville city officials realized the value of Correctcraft's offer and granted a 60-year lease on the required property. But complaints rose up from the World War II veterans. The land had previously been designated as a park, and veterans were concerned that Correct Craft was attempting to take away their birthright. It came to a point where the city was going to have a meeting on whether to break our contract or not. And uh, uh, I happened to, we were wondering how in the world do we fight this? How, how do we? Uh, deal with this problem. And uh, I went into the Ford garage there and uh, the parts man back at the parts counter said, Walt, he was a member of our church, and uh, he said, uh, Walt, uh, I can tell you how to stop all this noise. Uh, and uh, I listened to him because I thought, well, boy, if he has the answer, I want to know what it is. But when he got through, I didn't think too much of it. He said, uh, uh, why don't you get uh, a shipment of silver dollars and pay this, the uh, payroll, pay all your people off with silver dollars? And uh, I thought, well, silver dollars, dollar bills, checks, or whatever you got, what's the difference? But I didn't get any other answer. And we were asking the Lord for answers, and so finally it came to the point that we'd, that was the only answer that I could think of. So I called the bank and I said, I, I want enough silver dollars to pay our payroll with. We paid everybody that weekend with a paper bag full of silver dollars. And they headed for town with them. And uh, it wasn't more than 30 minutes until another one of my friends that was a deacon in our church called me. He was the manager of the A&P store. He said, well, don't ever do that again. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, uh, I can't close the drawers in this cash register here in the store. I said, everybody's bringing in those silver dollars that you paid them with. And then another store called me. And uh, it went right across town. Well, uh, we went into that meeting not knowing which way this thing was going to go. But we found that, that uh, there were a number of people who had been belittling us and giving us trouble on the streets before were there at that meeting, and they all wanted to make the, the after the silver dollar thing, they all wanted to, to, to make the motion to give us the property. And so we ended up, when we walked away from it, the whole town was back our friends again, and, uh, and uh, we were in a great position uh, of having the property given to us instead of just having a contract on it. So silver dollars uh, worked. A Titusville newspaper editorial ran a story about the importance of correct craft to the city. It read, estimating four to a family, the total number of people living off the correct craft payroll is 1,040 which is about one-third of our population. The Titusville plant remained in operation from 1942 to 1955. The U.S. government came through with the contracts as promised. One contract in particular seemed like a big moneymaker for the company, calling for 3,000 boats bound for the conflict in Korea Correct Craft eagerly accepted the contract, anticipating the growth and revenues expected from such a deal. But the company's zeal was short-lived. The chief inspector came to the plant in Orlando to discuss the contract with the Maloons. He asked if Correct Craft was aware that they were one of only two companies in the entire Southeast who did not have an expense account for the inspectors. He said the easy way to do it is to have a fictitious expense account uh, with one of your employees and uh, just let it be charged off against the government contract. Well, of course, uh, 
Walt uh, was sitting on the, his side of the desk and uh, the government inspector and I were sitting on the other side of the desk and uh, we, we were flabbergasted and after he left, uh, we felt like as if that uh, the inspector had uh, used poor judgment even mentioning such a thing because after all the contract says no gratuities, in spelling it out they said uh, not even a Coca-Cola or a cup of coffee. So we really thought that uh, he was not going to uh, bear down on us on this, but uh, after a few days we began to realize that uh, he really meant it because uh, he began turning down the boats uh, quite regularly. The inspector rejected an extremely high number of boats coming off the line. The Maloons wondered if they shouldn't simply pay the man off. After all, it would be much less expensive. However, they refused to stoop to corrupt means in the name of business. By the end of the year, Correct Craft had produced 2,200 boats, with 600 of the rejected ones stacked up in the storage yard. The bank withdrew all its commitments. The contract by this time had cost the company $1 million. They also owed half a million dollars to 228 creditors. Correct Craft creditors recommended that the company file Chapter 11 of the Bankruptcy Act, which allows management to continue in the interest of the creditors. This action was taken in August of 1959. All the employees were requested to resign, and only the most essential workers were rehired. How could the plant operate without money? Still, the Maloons trusted in the Lord. Friends of the Maloons lent them help in their time of need. A loan came from a prominent businessman from Norway who had become a friend of the Maloons through the many boat show breakfasts Correct Craft had sponsored. The loan would sustain the company for a while longer, but more money was needed, and where would it come from? Bankruptcy court proceedings continued for six years, in 1964, the small creditors had already been paid off. 101 of them received 100% of what Correct Craft owed them. At this point, the court informed Correct Craft and its creditors that the company would be liquidated in 10 days. Correct Craft quickly formulated a plan. Well, then we stood 127 creditors left, and I had telephoned every one of them, and I wrote every one of them letters, and uh, in the letter, I sent a copy of the letter and a st stamped, uh, readdressed envelope back to me, uh, asking them to sign it if they would agree to 10% to within six months and release us from the, uh, the court at the end of six months. Or we would have to accept the liquidation, which would mean uh, no one would get hardly anything. Well, uh, 99 out of the 127 uh, sent me back letters and I had them in my hand to take to the court when it came time to go. And uh, the judge said, uh, well, uh, I'll have to poll them myself. Well, I, I knew that he would, and he did. But he evidently got the same answer because uh, he notified us that we could operate for the next six months and, and, and uh, raise the money and pay the 10% and then we could be released. Subsequently, the court released Correct Craft from Chapter 11 of the Bankruptcy Act on the first business day of 1965. Correct Craft made a commitment to eventually repay all of its creditors 100% of the principal. Immediately after being released from Chapter 11, the company repaid 20% of the debt to its larger creditors instead of just the required 10%. About 25 years later, in 1984, only $147,000 of the original debt remained. By May of that year, the balance was down to $50,000. In July, the company would need all available money to go to manufacturing boats for the next season. Therefore, if Correct Craft were to pay off its indebtedness, it must do so by June. The needed money came in a most unexpected manner. Correct Craft sponsored a bass fishing team. Each year, this team received a bass nautique as payment. In turn, Correct Craft received half of all the prize money earned by the team. 
In May, the Correct Craft Bass team entered the Super Bass 3 tournament in Palatka, Florida. That week, the Correct Craft team reeled in more than 53 pounds of bass and won the grand prize of $100,000. Correct Craft received half of their winnings, which was exactly the amount the company needed to pay off the last of its creditors. The Maloons have used the experience of bankruptcy to help others facing similar situations. Members of the Maloon family have traveled as missionaries to various countries, telling the account of how God brought their family through the trying ordeal of bankruptcy and sharing the invaluable lessons learned from the experience. Each year, the Maloons sponsor turnaround weekends all across the country. Christian business people who are facing heavy financial hardships are invited to attend these retreat weekends. Many of these people stand to lose everything they have worked for, and in some cases what the generations before them have worked for as well. Within this support group, the Maloons share their experiences and offer encouragement. Through this caring ministry, Correct Craft has helped many people work through their financial difficulties through the help of the Lord. It's, it's a comforting thought to realize that uh, uh, the pain and the hurt now is the preparation for something that will be a real blessing not only to you but to others. And so uh, just remember that uh, this is preparation and not punishment. And then there's another thing that uh, I had to learn that uh, we try to pass on, and that is, it's always too soon to quit. In the 1920s, the earliest days in the history of Correct Craft, the company's boat line consisted of rowboats and other small wooden boats. Years later, in the 30s, Correct Craft moved towards the production of fashionable mahogany utility boats, such as the 1939 Deluxe 17-footer. The first Correct Craft end boards were introduced in the late 1930s. Correct Craft's contributions to boating and the sport of water skiing are legendary. In the 1930s, soon after the birth of water skiing, Correct Craft was already manufacturing water skis and giving exhibitions on local lakes. Correct Craft introduced the first tournament caliber inboard towboat, the Tournament Skier. Another first by Correct Craft was the water tow pylon. In the 1940s, Correct Craft pioneered trailering as opposed to the railroad as its primary system for boat delivery. Not only was this more convenient, it also meant less damage to the boats in transit. With the onset of World War II, Correct Craft's production turned from recreational to military. During those years, the firm built numerous plywood pontoon boats, as well as the assault boats used for the legendary crossing of the Rhine River. After the war ended, prosperity increased. Correct Craft introduced its sporty inboard runabouts, such as the 1948 19-foot custom runabout. Also available were varnished sedans, open hulls, and smaller plywood ski boats. By 1949, Correct Craft offered over 16 different models, from small 15 and a half foot junior utilities up through 32 foot cabin cruisers. The popular 19 foot racing runabout was still very much in demand. With the arrival of 1950 came the all new 14 foot Atom 25 plywood utility. Price tag, $1,095. Super sales in 1952 prompted Correct Craft to design boats of the larger variety, such as its luxurious 50-foot yacht. By 1957, Correct Craft halted production of its larger boats and also decreased the number of available models. The most popular Correct Craft boat at this time was the 1957 17-foot Starflight Utility. And of course, with the 50s came the tail fins, the wraparound windshields, and the two-tone paint jobs. This style remained popular through 1961. The last true runabout made its final debut with the 1958 Collegian. The hull of this boat was finished with two-tone decks, 
two-tone hull sides, and light blue seats and interior. In 1959, Correct Craft was approached about building fiberglass boats. The idea came from a Miami ski school operator named Leo Benz. Benz offered to sell Correct Craft his fiberglass boat molds, but W.O. wanted no part of the deal. Benz returned in 1960 offering to give the fiberglass molds to Correct Craft in exchange for providing maintenance for Benz's boats at his ski school. He also wanted Correct Craft to build him one fiberglass boat a year for three years. The Maloons tested his boat and decided they really did like its performance. Thus, the world-famous Ski Nautique was born. The year was 1961. But the new boats needed promoting, so Correct Craft offered the top 15 skiers in the world a new Ski Nautique at half price, if they would use it and take it to their tournament competitions. All but one accepted the offer, launching Correct Craft into the realm of tournament water skiing. Correct Craft has made significant efforts to promote the sport of water skiing. In 1975, Correct Craft began its sponsorship of the Masters Water Ski Tournament, the most prestigious water ski event in the world. In 1977, Correct Craft formed its own ski team, made up of the world's finest skiers. Correct Craft's reputation in the market of tournament inboards has been unparalleled. The Ski Nautique 2001 made its exceptional debut in 1982. It was the exclusive towboat of the 24th Annual Masters Water Ski Tournament and at the World Cup in London. The 2001 also pulled at the regional tournaments and at the nationals. In addition, Correct Craft boats perform in ski shows at every SeaWorld theme park in the country. Not bad for a boat company that started on a shoestring budget in 1925. Today, Correct Craft's continuing standard of excellence is the benchmark for all other boat manufacturers worldwide. The commitment of the Maloons and Correct Craft is the same today as it was in 1925. Building boats to the glory of God.